wonderful. So, um, my name is Monique Botha, um, and we're going to be doing neurodiversity, autism, and mental health. So, a bit about me quickly so that you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm autistic. I'm an autism academic that focuses on autism, minority stress, mental health, and autistic community connectedness. I'm currently based at the University of Stirling as a research fellow um, and I did my PhD and MSc in psychology at the University of Surrey and before this actually um, I spent four years working with autistic children, young people and their families as a social care practitioner because that's actually what my undergraduate degree was in. So just briefly a bit of a content warning. Obviously this topic is very sensitive in nature and I'll briefly touch upon suicidality, self-harm and victimisation. There are resources included at the end of the presentation should anyone need support or advice. Importantly, I appreciate that this is a difficult topic for many people. It's important to be kind to yourself during and after the talk. It's okay to step back from it if something is a bit triggering and to rejoin later. But also, it sounds cliche, but doing something good for yourself after is a good thing, even if that's as simple as having a cup of tea or a conversation with someone. So what are we going to cover today? I'm going to talk about the prevalence and types of co-occurring mental health conditions in neurodivergent young people and in particularly the autistic community. I'm going to discuss factors which contribute to the development of mental health issues, um, particularly how um, with regards to neurodiversity and mental health and how neurodiversity pushes us to kind of understand mental health from a social ecological perspective, which really just means putting people um, in the context of their everyday lives. And further, how we can improve mental health in neurodivergent young people, um, including fostering positive environments at home, in schools and in communities. So, neurodivergent people are more likely to have a co-occurring mental health condition compared to non-neurodivergent people, including, but not limited to, anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. For autistic people this can be up to six times higher than neurotypical people, especially for anxiety or depression. Estimates can put it anywhere between 30 to 70 percent of autistic people having a co-occurring um, mental health condition or more and often a lot of autistic people will have both anxiety and depression. It can be taken less seriously or go unrecognised because of diagnostic overshadowing. And what this really means is that everything becomes reduced to autism. So the, the signs of anxiety or depression don't get picked up um, because they're conflated with autism. Anxiety and depression can start at a very young age for neurodivergent people. A recent study found that children as young as six were showing signs of anxiety and depression um, while being autistic. Importantly, autistic people are more likely to self-harm, both in ways easily recognised as, as self-harm, but also in less recognised ways, such as, for example, head banging. Autistic people are also at a much higher risk of having thoughts of suicide, attempts of it, and are more likely to die early by suicide. Um, and this is really important because one of the leading causes of death for autistic people is unfortunately suicide. Two thirds of autistic people have thoughts of suicide, while one third have a history of attempts which shows you just how prevalent it is um, in the autistic community. 
Now, when we come to mental health, there's a there's an, an issue when we discuss mental health and autism, and it's that we tend to pathologize difference. So we end up putting neurodivergent people under the microscope and treating them as if they're individuals that live in a vacuum. So we put we focus on their thinking processes, their personality and their traits. We focus on their negative feelings and their emotions and their behaviors. And we always try to intervene at an individual level as if it's almost the fault of the neurodivergent person that they experience these mental health issues. But actually neurodiversity really means um, putting autistic people or neurodivergent people within a social ecology and understanding them within that social ecology. And what that means is that you put them in a broader context. So really look at the homes and lives of autistic people, what's happening at schools and works, within communities, um, in terms of things like healthcare access, the norms and expectations that neurodivergent people have to live up to, and also the social and cultural values around um, things like disability and divergence. It's also important to remember this with intersections with race, ethnicity, gender and sexuality, for example, because the more that these things overlap, the more intersections there are for consideration and actually the more space there is for things like marginalization or experiencing forms of victimization. When you break down the social context for neurodivergent people, what you see is that we experience minority stress, which is an excess stress burden that non-neurodivergent people don't experience. And importantly, it can lead to um, disparities in mental and physical health outcomes. And I'm going to list these, but we'll go over each of them. Um, but that includes neuronormativity, stigma, masking and concealment, which is trying to blend in rather than stand out, bullying and peer victimization, facing barriers to healthcare, and then also identity struggles because they grow up to internalize these events and processes. So what is neuronormativity? It is the assumption that everyone thinks and experiences the world the same way or that everyone should think about and experience the world in the same way. It refers to the structures in the world that are set up around a dominant um, or non-neurodivergent and neuronormative way of thinking. The important thing is that these systems are often confusing or ambiguous for neurodivergent people who think and experience the world differently. If you think about all of the invisible rules that we have around engaging with other people, um, social activities, um, even the rules, the invisible rules that govern having conversations, um, there are a lot of structures that are set up in ways that make it hard for neurodivergent people to um, engage because none of these rules or expectations are necessarily explicit. Similarly, there's stigma. So when you're different and you don't fit into what we've described as a neuronormative world, you can become stigmatized by the people around you. Neurodivergent people are undervalued for the way that we think and how we experience the world. And what I mean by this is that autistic ways of communicating, for example, um, are stigmatized for being different. And this might be things like um, a lack of eye contact. It might be um, quite direct expression. It might be something as simple as skipping over small talk and getting to the point or it might be for example if the autistic person is non-speaking and uses assisted forms of communication which themselves are chronically undervalued in a world that tends to prefer that people speak with spoken words rather than using AAC for example. Aut autism is stigmatized as both a label and a way of be being which means basically that you attract 
other people's stigmatizing beliefs regardless of disclosure um so when we point to specific behaviors that's that's what i mean even if an autistic person does not disclose that they are autistic um they still end up being treated differently um, for acting in ways that might be unexpected by the people around them but similarly that's not saying that disclosure is the easy path um, because the label itself is also stigmatized so it doesn't necessarily make that situation better which we'll discuss in the next slide um, about masking similarly neurodivergent and autistic people are constantly bombarded with messages about autism and stereotypes. When I interviewed autistic people from all over the world, interestingly, one of the things that one participant said was, you know, he watches the way that certain people make decisions around vaccinating their children. And, you know, they say that um, autism would be a worse outcome for that child than getting a um disease which could otherwise be eradicated which might actually be fatal for the child and the participant used a really um clear expression of that stigma he was like that tells you that autism is a cross in the box or a red card that people really really do not want or like autism or autistic people um so constantly autistic people do get messages um that can be quite stigmatizing In terms of masking and concealment, it might be an oversimplification, but the easiest way of describing masking is it's trying to fit in rather than stand out. And this might take place in a lot of different ways. It might be, for example, suppressing neurodivergent related behaviors. So for example, autistic people stim, which tends to be, for example, um, repetitive movements or feeling touching things specifically for sensory feedback um you see a lot of autistic people who might for example tap their fingers together like this or rock backwards and forwards um masking can include trying to stop those behaviors from happening in front of people um so that you don't give away that you're neurodivergent it can also mean not mentioning that you're neurodivergent and this isn't as simple as not saying I'm autistic but actually it can mean suppressing the language um, that you develop in your culture so for example the autistic community does have lots of different words for different things and develops a language around the autistic experience it can be trying to make sure that you don't slip any of those things into conversation so saying you know avoiding saying that you've got special interests um trying to avoid talking about your special interests too much for example ultimately it comes down to trying to act like the people around you specifically to avoid stigma and discrimination um so there have been some people who see this as a type of compensation but it's not that neurodivergent people want to behave like the other people around them because they think that the other people are really great but rather they don't want to make themselves a target so they might look at their peers especially when they're young and in school and try to act like the people around them so that they go unnoticed and don't attract that stigma so it can be as simple as trying to mirror the behavior of other people importantly essentially it means trying to adapt yourself as much as possible to the neuronormative world around you and I really try to stress this as much as possible that that is a really painful process it essentially means chipping away at parts of your natural ways of being chipping away at your identity and trying to mold yourself into something that is less inconvenient for a world that isn't necessarily made for you or adapting to you um, and it is more stressful than I think anyone realizes until they're in the position of doing it the important things is that this inherently involves hiding emotions 
it is putting on a mask and not necessarily telling the world how you feel so it inherently involves suppressing emotions and also importantly it cuts off conversation from the get-go because it always means that you are trying to hide part of yourself and it's not necessarily that you are ashamed of it but rather that you think other people will be ashamed of it. These two things take up a lot of energy and internal resources and have a detrimental impact on mental health substantially consistently over time. Similarly bullying and victimization this is really important neurodivergent people are more likely to experience peer victimization bullying and what's termed mate crime which is basically the um bullying experienced by people who are meant to be considered friends and allies to the young person importantly it isn't the label necessarily. Now to put this in perspective, um, up to 85% of um, autistic people will experience some form of bullying and victimization during school um, and this also actually unfortunately extends to post school. So it is a massive problem um, but it isn't because of disclosure so you'll have seen perhaps um on twitter over the last couple of weeks autistic people have been talking about peer victimization in school and it wasn't that they necessarily disclosed to their peers that they were autistic and that wasn't what precipitated bullying it is specifically neurodivergent ways of processing the world and being that were picked up on. So it could be the way that autistic people speak, move, the topics that they um, focus on, for example, that other non-neurodivergent kids pick, pick up on um, and then victimise them for. Um, so it isn't necessarily the label that is attracting the stigma. So just suppressing the label, just not disclosing or not telling your child that they are neurodivergent isn't going to mean that they experience necessarily less victimization. Um, importantly, exposure to these kinds of victimization impact on self-esteem, mental health and well-being consistently and long term. It puts people on a bit of a downward downward spiral because spiral because the more that the victimization impacts on self-esteem um, and mental health, they become kind of entwined in a feedback loop, whereby lower mental health can reduce self-esteem, but also reduced self-esteem can then lower mental health. Then once you've survived all of these things, there are really substantial barriers to healthcare that prevent um, neurodivergent young people from necessarily getting the support that they need. Misinformation exists even amongst medical professionals about autism and this is the same for um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, ADHD for example um, and a lot of the information might be outdated um, or stigmatizing in and of itself, including failure to recognize autism um, in people who defy the, the stereotypes that we've set, including failure to recognize it in women or gender minorities. Importantly, autistic people can struggle to verbalize their experiences in a way that professionals register. And this isn't, let me make this clear, this isn't a problem with how autistic people are um, verbalizing it it's a problem with how um non-autistic professionals are registering it so for example autistic people can be very blunt in how they say it. they can sit in front of a gp or a psychologist and say i am experiencing depression i am down or i am having thoughts of suicide but their facial expression or tone for example might not match what the professional thinks 
the tone and facial expression should be for someone who is experiencing those emotions so they get picked up as being non-genuine even when they they are right so it gets picked up as being disingenuous but actually it's just the way that autistic people communicate and there's very little information about that parents often have to do a lot of pushing and advocating to make sure their child has adequate support and part of this is that services are also chronically underfunded so it usually is the a case of putting out fires everywhere which means that it's not responsive responsive to necessarily preventing crisis but rather only responsive when people are in crisis um, and parents often have to do a lot of pushing to make sure that there is any support in place. Similarly, because there is this stigmatizing information that a lot of medical professionals might still have about neurodivergent conditions, um, or for example, that, um, sorry, yeah, or that they might have experiences of being dismissed and not believed for their experiences. Um, neurodivergent young people can start to disengage from services to avoid further hurt. Basically, this means that they're like, well, you don't believe that I'm in distress. You don't believe that I need support. So actually, why would I engage with you? any further um, because I just get hurt when I do. So then they begin to withdraw from services, making it even harder to ensure that help is received. And not to forget that in amongst all of that, neurodivergent people are trying to develop their identities, just like any other young person um, who is growing up. They're trying to process the stigma, discrimination, receiving mixed messages all the time, um, coping with neuronormativity and expectations that aren't made clear, um, trying to hide their experiences, but also being told to be yourself. Um, and that's on top of the usual burdens um, that young people have, such as schools, exams, hormones, home life, um, the development of, you know, the first intimate relationships with um, partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever. Um, and this is why it's termed minority stress, because unless you are part of a social minority that is marginalized by greater society, these are the kind of stresses that you won't experience. And once you have the context, mental ill health and burnout amongst neurodivergent people, including autistic people, suddenly really makes sense. Um, autistic people are responsive to a host of often very unachievable demands. And it might be hopeless because once you put the um, neurodivergent young person in broader social contact where you're looking at all of these, it might feel like you're seeing barriers basically everywhere, things that are affecting um, that young person um, detrimentally. But actually, it also means that there are lots of avenues for change and opportunities for change and lots of chances to disrupt some of those patterns. Part of this will mean fostering a positive identity. To do that, you need to be honest with the person about the way their brain works. Right. And this means really fostering an understanding of themselves embracing their neurology instead of fighting it and understanding the strengths and limitations of being ADHD or autistic for example and the highs and lows that that involves. It means making sure that neurodivergent young people have access to positive messages and importantly I stress this whenever whenever I say this this doesn't mean access to like the superpower messages because autism and ADHD isn't, um, <laughs> it isn't a superpower, it is literally a neutral, different way of being, right? So it means stressing different, but equal. It means 
talking to young people about their experiences in a normative and stigmatizing world help them to process it so when they're having these tra traumatizing experiences whether it's being um excluded from friendship groups and schools experiencing trouble with accessing systems talk to them and help them process it so that they're not sitting on it alone it also means providing access to similar others belonging this is a powerful tool in challenging stigma normativity and loneliness when i say that it i don't mean just people with a similar diagnosis what i mean is they might both be neurodivergent and share an interest in something else like reading books for example provide access to written resources by people like the young person it's important to be able to see someone like you grow up and this is the thing a lot of neurodivergent people don't actually realize that there is a whole world of other neurodivergent people who got there first and it can feel really hopeless and you can feel alone and it can be powerful seeing someone like you who is an adult and is okay but regardless of all that it's about reminding neurodivergent people of their inherent value as they are where they are and i mean this full stop it doesn't matter if they are developing the skills that you want them to that you think they should that they think they should it means recognizing the neurodivergent young person as they are in this moment and saying even if they do not change they have inherent value as is in terms of fostering positive environment it means providing environments that are suitable for many ways of being this means that the environment is flexible to adaptation shape environments around people rather than people around environments it can be as simple as providing multiple ways to fill in forms for example or ensuring that the lighting that you have in a room isn't going to be triggering to someone it means being welcoming of differences in communication and be behavior including having frank and open conversations with young people to break down stigma and stereotypes it means breaking down the assumption for example that eye contact or lack of eye contact is somehow rude or dismissive or that you need to be making eye contact to be able to listen for example um, that is a really simple stereotype and stigma that can be broken down to mean that autistic people don't get stigmatized for not always making eye contact in ways that are expected in order to do this most effectively i think working in consultation with neurodivergent people to create spaces and systems that are accessible to them is important generally people will tell you what it is that they need and what it is that will help it can be as simple as asking what would make this space comfortable to you what would make this system easier for you how can we make this better and importantly and i stress this all the time to everyone that i can you need to make demands rules and expectations explicit unwritten expectations are inherently by nature normative because they are relying on a common understanding developed for the for the way that an average person thinks if there are unwritten rules you are excluding people making and fostering a positive environment can be as simple as making expectations explicit so as i said um provide space within these environments for belongingness belongingness and ways for like-minded people to interact including setting up whether it's like clubs and societies for example challenge inaccessibility and neuronormativity it doesn't always need to be in front of the young person christ there are a lot of teenagers that would be mortified if you challenge some of these things in front of them but actually 
do it when they're not around. When you see a system that would be inaccessible to them, um, challenge that and make, you know, take steps towards a more equal future um, because bit by bit that will foster a more positive environment. Importantly, just don't say you don't need to mask around me. Make spaces where someone can let their guard down gradually and learn that it is okay to be themselves in those spaces. But masking exists partly to protect. Even if it does wear down internal resources, even if it's not ideal, you're dealing with neurodivergent people who have experienced rejection in a lot of different settings routinely throughout their life. If you just say, you don't need to mask around me, the young person will look at you and be like, aha, uh-huh, sure, okay. Um, but if you create space where they do not experience rejection, where they become gradually more and more themselves, then they will work out by themselves that they don't need to mask in those spaces and that they are in a safe environment. Similarly, it means creating a space where neurodivergent people can talk about mental health. Remember, if you shy away from the conversation, they will too. It means being explicit about things like anxiety and depression. It can mean taking someone to one side and saying, I am concerned about your mental health because X, Y and Z. Would you like to talk to me about any thoughts or feelings you might be having? If you don't want to talk to me, that is also okay. But is there someone that you trust that I can tell you are experiencing these things too so that you can talk to them? The most important thing is that you provide a space where they can talk because we do like to talk about mental health as a society except for when it crosses over into mental ill health and we become uncomfortable. It can be really vital to create a space for someone where they can say, I am struggling or I am having thoughts of suicide. What's important to remember is that even if you cannot fix the whole system, it is a powerful thing to provide an accessible, welcoming space which interrupts the inaccessibility and uncertainty of other spaces. So when I was showing you this big system, it can feel overwhelming because there are so many barriers that neurodivergent young people face. It can feel like there is nothing that we can do because it's it's the entire system. But actually, just providing one space which breaks up the monotony of that inaccessibility and rejection can be exceptionally powerful. And honest conversations go a long way when people are experiencing depression and anxiety or having thoughts of suicide. Um, and it is about the, the honesty because as well as that, neurodivergent people tend to be quite blunt. I don't mean um, to generalise, um, but in general, some autistic people can be quite blunt and they, they see... Um, people beating around the bush as being in some way not genuine. Um, so having straightforward conversations can help. Some resources, because obviously this was a quite hard topic. Um, if you feel unsafe or in need of immediate attention um, because you feel like you might harm yourself, you can go to hospitals, accident and emergency departments, or call 999 and ask for an ambulance. Similarly, um, for England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, you can call NHS 111 um, or NHS Direct for Wales. Um, some less immediate resources, if you're struggling with your mental health, you can reach out to um, various charities such as Shout, Samaritans, Mind, or Scottish Autism, for example.